he gazed into the future and saw wonders never imagined, incredible journeys and amazing machines, melding science and art he created a radical new form of storytelling that had never been seen before, science fiction. More than a century before our time, Jules Verne foresaw the world we live in and how it one day might end. A century ago, in a remote region of Siberia, hundreds of square miles of forest were devastated by the largest meteor to strike the Earth in modern times. That impact is known as the Tunguska event. If Tunguska had hit on a major city, it would have been one of the, the outstanding events in history that everyone in the world would know about. As it was, it hit in the wilderness, and it's pretty much the specialized knowledge of scientists. But one man had already foreseen the danger of events like Tunguska. A best-selling author of science fiction, who that very same year published a story warning of the terrible threat of meteors. But because the truth about Tunguska remained a mystery until the 1960s, critics dismissed the book as sheer fantasy. They were wrong. It's certainly easy to imagine the impact of a mile-wide asteroid that could uh, end in the death of a billion people and perhaps even destabilize civilization. We've never seen it happen, but it's a distinct reality. That's something that we only, as scientists, have realized in the last 10 or 20 years. At some levels, Jules Verne realized it a century ago. In the history of the written word, few have had a more ambitious imagination than Jules Verne. He invented not only a new genre, but whole new worlds of exploration and adventure. The father of science fiction, he foresaw the very world we live in and the worlds that might yet be. The Arthur C. Clarke of his day, he wrote books by the dozens and sold them by the millions. His secret, to imagine the unimaginable. I would not be surprised to see him in print in 200 years. I mean, he was one of the first guys to talk seriously about aeronautics, about submarines, about space flight. So by that fact alone, he's a very advanced figure, a mighty figure. Verne predicted the glittering machines of the space age, a dazzling feat for a man born in the grimy age of steam. I think the magic ingredient that made Jules Verne a novelist people read in every nation and translated into every language was the sheer delight he took in technology. He was the guy who took all those nuts and bolts of what was going on at the height of the Industrial Revolution and turned it into romantic magic, and that appealed to people all over the world. He really changed the tenor of the times. He made the unthinkable thinkable. He made the invisible visible. sent vehicles not yet invented into worlds not yet explored. His fictional heroes led mankind into whole new realms of discovery. With more than 200 movies bearing his name, Verne is the most adapted author in the history of film. A writer whose stories are endlessly retold. In an incredible 65 books, Verne attempted to depict not only life tomorrow, but the entire story of human existence. The ultimate goal of his work was to describe the whole world, by which he didn't mean only the planet, but humanity in its entirety, human destiny in its entirety. Transporting readers into every world imaginable, Verne reached back in time to the lost civilization of Atlantis and forward 
tens of thousands of years to the mysterious civilizations of the distant future. Nearly a century after Verne's death, the world again learned just how incredibly far-sighted he was. In 1989, Verne's great-grandson found a family safe and made an explosive discovery. Although I saw the safe was empty, I was still a little suspicious and wanted to make sure. So the manufacturers dynamited it, and the top flew off, and at the bottom lay many papers, including the manuscript Paris in the 20th century. The book was finally published in 1994, 131 years after it was written. Its uncanny depiction of modern Paris explains why Verne had to shelve it. My jaw dropped when I read it. I think, in fact, it would have had an effect on contemporary Parisians, almost as shattering as actually going to the 1960s, which most people from the 1860s would not have survived. I mean, it's just too much, you know? The future shock is just too intense. In Verne's novel, Paris is powered by the mysterious demon of electricity, a strange new force in his time. Dominated by vast financial houses, the Paris of the future is geared to one thing, making money. Day after day, an army of workers toils with a battery of unheard of technological devices, calculators, faxes, and copying machines. While such amazing inventions as elevators and automatic walkways would have stunned Verne's readers, they crush the spirit of the book's hero, an impoverished young writer out of place in a world run by machines. One of the things he got absolutely right was the hero and his alienation from the world. I mean, we've, we've got a fascinating situation of a, a young man looking around a society dominated by technology and feeling utterly alienated from it. While Verne's Paris bustles with horseless carriages and electromagnetic trains, his penniless hero walks everywhere on foot, a lone rebel who refuses to fit in. This is a work which is set a full hundred years in the future. Um, makes that leap, is comfortable with that leap, works it out in some detail. Um, it's uncannily close to what Paris really was like in the 1960s. Verne envisioned not only the city's future history, but its greatest landmark. Yards from where he described a towering lighthouse stands the very symbol of Paris, the Eiffel Tower, built 30 years later. He probably knew where the empty lots were in Paris, where if you were going to build something big, it would have to be. Yet even Verne's foresight wasn't infallible. Just to counter this notion of him as someone with a, an uncannily prescient view of the future, in his highly technical Paris of 1960, people don't even write with pens with a steel nib. They still write with quills. He, the idea of a typewriter never occurred to him. Paris in the 20th century was a bleak tale. Malnourished, impoverished, and forgotten, Verne's hero one day collapses in the street and is left to die. When Verne sent the manuscript to his editor, it was rejected as too far-fetched. Like much of his fiction, the book was inspired by real life, Verne's own time in Paris as a young man. Sent there to study law at age 20, Jules was meant to follow the family business. But a career in law was the last thing on his mind. Paris in the 1840s was like Berkeley in the 1960s, a hotbed of radicalism. The bohemian mecca of the 19th century, and the place to be for an aspiring writer. There are no intellectual rivals to Paris if you're a French theatrical dabbler or wannabe novelist, so it was the place to go. Bohemia was invented by guys in that, in that period, and uh, you know, they, they were probably the first self-conscious literary counterculture. It was a very seductive milieu, and it was the only place in the world where that was going on. Verne plunged into this world and joined a group of like-minded young writers, artists, and poets. They called themselves the Eleven Without Women. 
Inspired by his new friends, Verne gave up law and began writing. Not novels, but plays. At the same time, he developed an obsession with subjects of little use to a playwright. Geology, geography, astronomy, and math. He started collecting facts fairly early on, long before he invented science fiction. And I don't think he knew why he was doing it, except at perhaps some instinctual level where his creativity was reaching out for the facts on which he could build. In the end, he had about 20,000 index cards full of interesting facts. Verne's true future now loomed before him. But a hasty marriage almost ended his career before it even started. To be a better breadwinner, he left the theater for the French Stock Exchange. He hated it. Trapped in reality, Verne sought escape in fiction. I think what he was looking for was a means of earning a living that did not require him to go down and sell stocks. That instead he could do the things that he was really interested in, which was basically things like geography and cool gizmos. Verne's first fantastic voyage was inspired by a daredevil friend and a flight of fancy into the unknown. Jules Verne's first bestseller was a case of art imitating life. Its inspiration was a pioneer photographer and daredevil balloonist named Felix Tournachon. Like other pop stars who grow larger than life, he adopted a single name, Nadar. Everyone knew him, he was hugely famous. Everyone liked him, he was funny, he was interesting, he was a delightful guy. Nadar risked his life repeatedly. He was a swashbuckler. My belief is that, that Jules, the moment when his eyes opened to the possibility, the magic possibilities of science opening the world up was the moment when Nadar showed him his drawings for his balloon. For six long years, Verne had spent every spare moment letting his imagination run wild. The result was a page turner like none had ever seen. Enter the forbidden city of Timbuktu. Five weeks in a balloon established the hallmarks of Verne's unprecedented brand of storytelling, an alien frontier, and a futuristic invention to explore it. Ride out the dreaded Simon of the Sahara. Because it was all so factually convincing and written in this slightly dry style, people it seems to be real. And once he'd created that impact on people, gosh, I can produce something that I know I've made up and they take to be real or want to believe to be real. He knew he was onto something. The book was a runaway success. Sales soared even higher when Nadar launched a huge balloon over Paris as a publicity stunt. Signed up by the publishing magnate Jules Hetzel, Verne could at last quit his day job. But here was a guy with a troubled childhood and an unhappy marriage and a miserable career as a middle-aged stockbroker who had the courage to throw it all over in pursuit of a really radical literary vision, a, a kind of writing that, despite some precursors, had never been done before. Soon after, on the floor of the stock exchange, Verne made an announcement. I am leaving you, my friends, for I have written a novel of a new style. A new style his publisher dubbed The Extraordinary Voyages. It was the fulfillment of a dream Verne had nurtured since childhood. A time when he and his brother Paul would marvel at the wonders of their day. Or pretend to discover exotic lands. Now, Verne had fused these childhood passions to produce a new type of literature. Science fiction. up his first bestseller with an even more extraordinary voyage into the unknown. 
a journey to the center of the Earth, a story inspired by the then popular theory that the Earth was hollow. The deeper into the Earth his heroes journey, the older the species of animals they discover. Eventually, they reach an underworld populated by living fossils. One of the reasons that Journey to the Center of the Earth is such a, a, a powerful book even today is that wonderful combination of, quote, modern science and ancient mystery. He was definitely onto something in creating this kind of world inside our Earth, which appealed to what was in the air at the time, this, this sort of realization people were beginning to have that huge creatures had lived on the Earth before us. Once again, Verne's timing was perfect. The novel appeared as fossil evidence of dinosaurs rocked the church and the theory of evolution challenged the story of creation. An all-time bestseller, Journey to the Center of the Earth, would spawn generations of dinosaur lore. Verne's intrepid adventurers returned to the surface through an erupting volcano, as if shot from a cannon. A bizarre form of travel that would inspire Verne's next and most prophetic extraordinary voyage. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We are still go at this time. December 21st, 1968. Apollo 8 makes final preparations for an unprecedented mission, orbiting the moon. The astronauts aimed to boldly go where no man had gone before, or so they thought. We have ignition sequence start. A century earlier, others got there first, in a novel. One, zero. Fire rose to a prodigious height in the air. The glare of flame lit up the whole of Florida, and for a moment all over the country, night became day as that artificial hurricane rushed through the air. inspired the very first science fiction film. Written in 1865, Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon foretold the Apollo mission with breathtaking accuracy. Jules Verne did his homework on, on From the Earth to the Moon, consulted with professors of mathematics, consulted with experts in ballistics, um, uh, consulted with metallurgists, read everything he could, and did the math. He did the same math that the NASA scientists were going to do 100 years later. Verne's calculations proved uncannily correct the velocity needed to escape the pull of the Earth, the weight and size of the command module, the likely orbit of the space module, the effects of zero gravity, even the duration of the flight. When it was over, Apollo 8 splashed down in the Pacific, just two and a half miles from where Verne brought home his astronauts. Perhaps Verne's most startling insight wasn't how men would reach the moon, but which men and why. What was brilliant in From the Earth to the Moon is that he foresaw that it would be the Americans who would go to the moon first and that it would be as a consequence of a total war. To imagine 150 years before it happened, to see at a time when Europe still dominated the world, that it would be the US, bravo. 
Abend? In the aftermath of the American Civil War, Verne's astronauts are launched to the moon by a huge cannon, a super gun half a mile long, built by retired Yankee artillerists. In the 1980s, the idea of using a mega cannon for space launches was revisited by artillery expert Gerald Bull. But when he went to work for the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, Bull soon found a new and deadly application for his ideas. You could fire a cannon in Iraq and hit Washington, D.C. That was the guy's intention, and he got it from reading Jules Verne. Saddam's super gun was never built, but another is on the drawing board. A genuine space cannon, dubbed the Jules Verne Launcher. Leading the project is John Hunter, one of the scientists who helped U.S. intelligence expose Saddam's plans. The application for the Jules Verne Launcher is that we believe we can reduce space launch costs by a factor of 10 or 20. Theoretically, the space gun could furnish space stations with a ton of supplies every few hours. But instead of shooting supply capsules toward the moon, the new gun's target will be Mars. The Jules Verne launchers could play a critical role here. Just like the original polar expeditions where the guys would send supplies ahead of them, it's identical here if you want to go to Mars. And so the Jules Verne launcher would be the ideal way to send those caches ahead. From the Earth to the Moon launched Verne's career to new heights. In just a few years, he had become one of the most famous novelists in the world. But the strain of researching his extraordinary voyages was showing. Verne needed a change of pace. He moved his family from the bustle of Paris to the outskirts of his wife's hometown of Amiens. Here, close to the sea, he returned to his childhood, days spent playing on boats with his brother Paul. Now wealthy, Verne bought a boat of his own and sailed away from his cares. He was a child who had grown up by the sea, and of course he wanted to be a sailor in his youth, and that had always been denied him. But I think one of the greatest charms of writing on his yacht, which he did, was that his wife wasn't around. You know, the kids weren't underfoot, and he didn't have to keep up appearances. Ironically, in escaping to the sea, Verne had embarked on another extraordinary journey. Published in 1869, 20,000 leagues under the sea opened up a new frontier of adventure. The general population of the day had no idea about the oceans, really. Most people didn't know how to swim. Most people certainly had never been underwater. Imagine yourself a Frenchman in, in the late 19th century, reading that under the water there was this great panoply of wonderful creatures, and that it was possible to go there in a machine. It was really a, almost a da Vinci kind of prophecy. Three companions find themselves captured by the enigmatic Captain Nemo, a reclusive explorer who has severed all ties with the surface world. So begins their adventure aboard the Nautilus, a submarine so far ahead of its time it would inspire generations of sub-designers. Once again, Verne's powers of prediction had gone into overdrive. He imagined not just the world's first electric-powered submarine, but revolutionary diving equipment like scuba. In 1956, the world's first nuclear submarine made history by sailing under the North Pole. Christened the Nautilus, it fulfilled a similar voyage Verne's characters undertook a hundred years before. Verne was also among the first to believe in a real sea monster, then considered a myth, the giant squid. To illustrate just basically the kind of prophecy he had and how it still holds today, look at the giant squid. A hundred and 
Some years ago, nobody had seen a live giant squid and everything that he did was complete speculation. But his speculation is just as good today as it was then. Nobody has yet seen a live giant squid in the ocean. Perhaps the most fantastic creation in 20,000 Leagues was its main character, Captain Nemo, a misunderstood genius who uses technology to escape the hypocrisy of the surface world. In the sea, Nemo sought true freedom, a quest shared by Verne himself. Soon after 20,000 Leagues appeared, Verne's father died. Deeply religious, Pierre Verne rejoiced at his son's success, but worried for his soul. An agnostic, Jules hid the depth of his doubts from his pious father. It wasn't all he was hiding. Constant trips to Paris, apparently to see his publisher, masked another secret, a mistress. Liberated from his father's disapproval and invigorated by the new woman in his life, Verne now reached the apex of his career. Hit after hit rolled off the presses, including another epic journey, around the world in 80 days. Its hero is Phileas Fogg, an unflappable English gentleman who accepts a wager to travel around the world in what was then record time. A huge international bestseller, Around the World in 80 Days, is hardly science fiction. Like many of Verne's stories, it is a tale of high adventure in unexplored and exotic lands. Using every conceivable form of transportation, Fogg's incredible journey has become legendary. But ironically, the one form of transportation he did not use has become the one he is most famous for. Balloon travel. It was a detail added to the 1953 Oscar-winning movie by director Michael Todd that has stayed with the story ever since. Well, I think Michael Todd's attitude towards Around the World in 80 Days was, this is a huge portmanteau. We'll cram as much as we can in it, every star in the world, every method of transport, and every idea of Jules Verne that, that could fit in there. The fabulous moment when they're crossing the Alps, Passepartout leans down and picks out the ice for the champagne. It's, I think it's one of cinema's great moments. It's an epiphany. This is what travel ought to be like. Eighty Days was followed by a series of other adventure stories, many of which were huge hits in Verne's lifetime and later adapted for the theater and big screen. Michael Strogoff, Envoy of the Tsar, a story of intrigue in the Russian Empire. Mysterious Island. Shipwrecked on the Mysterious Island. Come on. What's it doing? I don't know. It's sealing us in. A story in which the enigmatic Captain Nemo returns once more. Aren't we able to do anything to save ourselves? There's nothing that can be done. And the first of several stories about asteroids. Hector Servadac, in which the occupants of a small part of North Africa are swept off the planet when a comet skims the Earth. A desert island survival story set in outer space. In just over a dozen years, Verne had become the greatest best-selling author of his century. But despite fame and wealth, Verne never slowed down. Day after day, year after year, he pushed back the boundaries of the imagination. He seemed to spend a lot of time behind locked doors. And if you look at the sort of top heroes of the 
of his books, they too seem to spend a lot of time in airtight capsules. Or submarines, a really small little wicker gondolas, like little fortress-like areas where they can sort of get a broader view or see things other people can't see, but no one can actually get them. And I, I think the reason he did that was because he just had a level of insight into other people that rendered him somewhat uncanny. He was just not a normal guy. This uncanny insight would be reflected in an anti-hero to rival Captain Nemo, a man who sought not to conquer the seas, but to master the skies. Robor, the Conqueror. The kind of figures to whom Jules Verne was drawn was someone who uses science and technology to create a world where he is unassailable. Robur and Nemo were his fantasy versions of himself. Um, and that, I think, is why he was drawn to that kind of hero. He didn't want to control the world, I think, but he did want to be in control of the world immediately around him. Inspiration for Robur came from his balloonist friend, Nadar, who persuaded Verne to join a society promoting experiments in flight. Such unlikely machines as steam helicopters remained mere flights of fancy. The idea of flight was scoffed at by many scientists. Verne did not agree. Inspired by Nadar's faith in flight, Verne created a fantastic machine every bit as far-sighted as the Nautilus. The Albatross. Forged of compressed paper harder than steel, yet only a fraction as heavy, the Albatross was held aloft by tiny blades. A prototype of reality. The Albatross of today is a new generation of superjets. Planes like the gigantic Airbus A380, able to carry 656 people. Or the blended wing megajets, capable of traveling halfway around the world without refueling. The next revolution in flight. All offspring of Verne's brainchild. When Robor the Conqueror was published in 1886, Verne was 58. Having traveled almost exclusively in his mind, he was astounded at his reception when he at last ventured out in his new luxury yacht. Jules Verne wasn't at all interested in his own fame and was extremely surprised when people welcomed him in such an extraordinary manner somewhere. In Morocco, for instance, he was welcomed there as if he was the French president or the king of the world. Admired by politicians, nobles, and even the Pope, Verne determined to wear fame as lightly as he could. All that would suddenly change with a shot in the dark. On the 9th of March, 1886, the French novelist Jules Verne returned home after an evening walk when his favorite nephew suddenly appeared from the shadows. Gaston Verne was clearly unwell. What was wrong, asked Jules. The youth replied in gibberish. Then he fumbled in his coat and pulled out a revolver. When doctors examined Verne, they concluded the bullet in his leg could not be removed. He would be lame for the rest of his life. Why had Gaston Verne shot his uncle? The reason he gave was he did it to make his uncle more famous, which is something only a madman would come up with. Certified insane, Gaston spent the rest of his life in institutions. Weeks after the shooting, Verne was devastated by another loss, the death of his close friend and publisher, Jules Hetzel. Less than a year later, his beloved mother died. Verne sank into a deep depression from which he would never fully recover. 
But slowly, life began to fall back into place. Neglected by his father as a child, Jewel's son, Michel, grew into a delinquent gambler and womanizer. After years apart, father and son finally reconciled. Soon, they began working together. The collaboration between Michel and his father was first and foremost a rekindling between father and son. Michel was very talented and a very good writer and was able to write novels under his father's name without anyone realizing the difference in terms of style. Michel shared Jules' fascination with the future and with the press. The result, in the year 2889, Diary of an American Journalist. Set in Centropolis, future capital of the United States, it follows a day in the life of the world's most powerful media magnet, Francis Bennett, owner of an electronic newspaper called the Earth Herald. So influential is Bennett, he's the virtual ruler of the world. A man able to control the fate of whole countries with just the nod of his head or the wave of his hand, as the book reveals. Mr. Bennett, the citizens of Great Britain implore you to join our petition. Will you help us in our bid to free ourselves from the American Empire? The central powers of Mars are in turmoil. Will you support the revolutionaries? Without Bennett's backing, no scientific undertaking gets off the ground. Please, Mr. Bennett, our suspended animation research urgently needs more funding. Please, with only your help, we can save the project. Written long before television or the internet, Michelle's story was a highly prophetic warning about the ever-increasing power of the media, set in a futuristic world where even the clouds carry advertising. Critics dismissed it as too far-fetched. As well as collaborating with Michelle, there was also another new influence in Verne's work. Verne, the private man, now decided to become a public figure and was elected as a town councillor in Amiens. I think it's a terrible thing for a science fiction writer to become a small-time politician. I think it was a bad career move. Set a bad precedent for the rest of us, quite frankly. Rather let the side down there. To everyone's surprise, Verne thrived in his new job. He campaigned for electric streetlights and the building of the town's famous circus theater. Verne's role as a counselor inspired another novel, one that posed a fundamental question about technology. Can it create a perfect society? Written in 1893, Propeller Island was about a floating city of millionaires on an endless pleasure cruise. 19th century fiction is about to become 21st century fact. The mammoth freedom ship will dwarf the largest oil tankers and cruise ships. It's the largest vessel ever to be built in the world. It's the first floating city in its entirety to circumnavigate the globe. They're considering it to be an engineering wonder of the world. When you mention it to people, they go, my gosh, why hasn't this been done before? What an interesting appeal. What a unique concept. And in respect to Jules Verne, apparently he was just ahead of his time. And all we're trying to do is make a Jules Verne fantasy into a today reality. Nearly a mile long, 750 feet wide, and 25 stories high, this floating city will offer all the comforts of dry land and, say the makers, be just as secure. It's been purported that a 100-foot wave will barely move it by one inch. It's almost three million tons. It dwarfs vessels by any configuration today. Three times the size of such mega cruisers as the Voyager of the Seas, Freedom Ship will be outfitted with the latest high-tech wizardry, dock in a new country every week, and keep residents endlessly amused. We have over 200 acres of recreation areas. We'll have all the stores, the restaurants. We'll have one of the largest duty-free shopping malls in the world. For the occupants of Propeller Island, monotony is their downfall. 
Bored by endless parties, they quarrel, then split into two camps. And after a struggle to steer the ship in opposite directions, their city is ripped in half. This question of how people can get on with other people is the big unresolved question that we still have today, which he knew in his heart science and technology was not going to solve. And so in a book like Propeller Island, he addresses this notion and says, you know, if you create this ideal environment which can go anywhere in the world, does that free us from the conflicts we have with each other? And the answer was no. The builders of Freedom Ship don't share Verne's pessimism. Ours is very elective. Everybody knows the laws. If they don't believe they can live with them, they simply just are not invited aboard the ship. They're so upbeat, they believe Freedom Ship will be the first of many. We certainly anticipate floating cities of the, of the future will be commonplace. Propeller Island was partly inspired by a trip Verne took aboard the Great Eastern Liner with his brother Paul. Just a year after the book was published, Paul died. It wasn't Verne's last loss. His mistress had also passed away. Confronted by the death of two more people so close to him, the workaholic Verne channeled his energy into an unlikely tale for the father of science fiction. A ghost story. But in Verne's hands, even the supernatural could inspire the shape of things to come. Set in the foreboding mountains of Transylvania, writer Jules Verne's Castle of the Carpathians was unlike anything he'd ever created. The lord of the castle is infatuated with a ghost, an opera singer, beautiful in life, unforgettable in death. Inspiration for writing a ghost story came from Verne's favorite author, the American writer Edgar Allan Poe. Unlike Poe's mysterious tales, Verne's takes an unexpected twist, a solution based on science rather than the supernatural. The ghostly singer is a hologram-like projection created by a machine. Her voice, just a recording. of the Carpathians predated the first film by a decade, the first talking film by four decades. Verne was grappling not only with the marvels of modern life, but life itself. In some ways, that is the next natural move for someone who says, can technology solve the problems of the world? Can technology tackle the problem of death? and he comes close to it. I mean, in the end, of course, it's a gramophone record and it's an illusion. But it is someone playing with the notion, can science bring back the beloved dead? Yet even for Verne, science had its limits. In one of his last works, technology failed to save humanity from a catastrophe no one of his time imagined. Meteors. More than a century before Hollywood, the Eternal Adam posed the ultimate Armageddon scenario. Set in the distant future, its hero is a young archaeologist called the Zartog, a man determined to discover humanity's origins. When research suggests mankind may be far older than believed, the Zartog embarks on a series of digs. He discovers an ancient artifact made of an unknown metal alloy. Inside, scrolls in a long-lost language, French. It's a letter from the last survivors of an ancient civilization, wiped out by a sudden cataclysm. Our civilization. The Zartog also learns that a civilization called Atlantis perished the same way millennia before. awful truth sinks in. 
Humanity has not only been destroyed many times, it's fated to be destroyed again. All the Zartar can do is wait for the end, knowing civilization will once more be forced to start over. One of the notions of the Eternal Adam is that we have been here before, that we are going round the circle again. Which, bearing in mind, the Earth is, what, three and a half billion years old, man's history is 10,000 years since the last Ice Age, that's an infinitesimal speck of the Earth's history. And so this notion that this could all have happened before, that is not a totally unreasonable notion at all. Yet in Verne's day, the notion of meteor impacts was far-fetched. The eternal atom was ignored. Nearly a century later, scientists take the threat of meteors seriously. Despite Verne's doubts, we now trust in science to save us. The technology is in hand uh, with a little development uh, to deflect an incoming comet or asteroid. The key right now is to find out if this threat is real or something for the future to worry about. With the dawn of a new century, Jules Verne was eclipsed. Rivals like H.G. Wells emerged to challenge his position as the undisputed master of what were called scientific romances. Yet after a long stretch of declining sales, Verne made a comeback. Published in 1904, Master of the World saw the return of the daring aeronaut, Robur. Verne had transformed the inventor of the albatross into a megalomaniac, bent on imposing peace on a divided world with his greatest invention yet, the terror. It was Jules Verne's ultimate fantasy machine, combining the power of a race car, an airplane, a ship, and a sub. As a weapon, it was the last word in peacekeeping. As a vehicle, it has no rivals, even to this day. In its version of Master of the World, Hollywood strayed from Verne's designs for the terror. But it faithfully captured the transformation of the idealistic Robur. I am a man unto myself, Mr. Prudent, who has declared war against war. That is the purpose for which this ship was built. Once more, Verne proved his genius for foresight. This time, the storm clouds of the 20th century. You have no choice. That Robur, by the end, is, is simply a megalomaniac. I am going to Neiman! Perhaps Jules Verne is realizing that before him lies a century in which megalomaniacs with powerful machines would do enormous damage to the world. I mean, to that extent, he was right, all too right. People talk about his worldview darkening toward the end, and I think that it did. I mean, he probably sensed the underlying trend of his society, which was a holocaust. And World War I was only 12 years away, you know. A guy with his ability, I think, could have smelled that. Like the dictators he prefigured, Robor is finally destroyed by his own ambition. Killed in a freak electrical storm, he could have avoided. His creator followed soon after. On the 24th of March, 1905, Jules Verne died peacefully at home. He was 78 years old. Born in the 19th century, Verne reached the threshold of the 20th in time to see many of his prophecies fulfilled. The first electric lights, the first telephone conversations, the first heavier-than-air flying machines, the first automobiles. So Jules Verne's legacy is that nothing is impossible for us if there is imagination. That's his legacy. With a genius for foresight and a flair for adventure, Jules Verne produced a towering body of work that still thrills millions. To generations after him, he left an even richer legacy. A blueprint for not only the inventions of our times, but the aspirations of the future. And even today, 
who can foresee how many of Jules Verne's ideas may yet come to pass? Thank you.